Mike and John in the morning. And joining us on the line, Senator Lana Tice with uh, what we call Lana's Legislative Lowdown. Good morning, Senator Tice. Good morning. That's new. I like it. Yeah, we just made it up this morning. Well, we were wondering. We, we had referred to that, and then we thought, I don't know if you would approve. I do. Okay, I do. good. That'll it's work. got legis- legislative approval. All right. Excellent. So we got that. Now, now you sponsored uh, a bill uh, that went through yesterday, I believe, and uh, it has to do with uh, helping out folks that may need some elective uh, procedures when it comes to medical procedures, elective procedures. So we want to talk a little about that. It's a resolution, so it's not, it's not a bill, but a okay. resolution. So we're trying to encourage the governor to uh, allow elective procedures because right now there are a lot of people who are waiting on medical procedures that aren't able to get them done, and there's a lot of confusion as to what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed, and so hospitals and a lot of medical providers are very hesitant to allow um, allow things that perhaps the governor absolutely allowed to have happen or wanted to allow to have happen, but they're, they, they're unsure and there's a lot of misunderstanding. So, for example, I've got a friend who can't get her melanoma treated. Uh, we had another friend who had issue getting chemotherapy done, So, I, and I don't think the governor, I'm not, I'm not blaming her for not wanting that done. It's just, like I said, there's a lot of confusion. Well, what so is your I'm, understanding of what the executive order's actually allow and don't allow or are you saying that the executive orders themselves are unclear the executive orders are unclear and then the the um information that follows so we are often asking questions what did you mean by this and so we'll ask the question and we'll get a lot of different answers and sometimes very conflicting answers as to whether or not that's what they intended so i'm just with this resolution i'm saying let's just open it up let's let the medical providers uh, determine what is what is uh, medically safe, and and let's go ahead and let them provide these services because many of them are actually needed. We might call them elective, but if you're walking around on a knee where every time you stand up, it's really really painful, or if you've got melanoma, those are things you really want to have treated right now. And if you can do it safely, we ought to make sure that that happens. Well, and there isn't, as you're saying, if I get this right, there isn't really a blueprint that says this is allowed, this is not. We're trying to get this to to make it where the doctors or medical facilities would decide that and if they can do it safely. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, the other side of this is obviously hospital systems derive a lot of their income from these elective procedures, actually a majority of their income. And we're seeing systems that are having to lay off personnel right now. For instance, Trinity Health, which runs St. Joe Livingston, they've laid off a number of individuals and citing the fact that these elective procedures are weighed down. So how much does that figure into this resolution? All across the state, we're doing layoffs for medical personnel. And, and I, don't, I don't think that's necessary. I think we have a, a, a lot of citizens across the state that desperately need to have these done. And we have a lot of people who would love to be at work providing these services, and I think they can do that safely. I'm advocating for getting as many people back to work safely as possible, and I think this is this place where this is literally their specialty. We ought to be making sure that that happens as soon as possible. So this would be more your, your hospitals and other uh, outpatient uh, services. What about, like, optical and, and dental? Is that included? or it, Medical providers, yes. So dental is included in that, yep. So otherwise, when it comes to the, the governor's executive orders, obviously there's been a bit of a, a, a push and pull over what the limit of her powers are. Um, the, the Senate last week, it might, you know, there was a bill that was put forward that would uh, basically rescind one of the acts that has given her some of these broad emergency powers and then restrict the time limit. Why don't you talk about that? Where is that at right now? So... That's, that's a really good question. So there are two acts, uh, emergency acts that are in place right now. One is from the mid-40s, PA 302 of 45, and one is from the mid-70s, PA 390 of 76, and they both speak to emergency declarations. Um, if you think about what was happening in 1945, we were in a world war. Uh, and it, it's really broad, and it, it gives her the power, uh, any governor, the power to declare an emergency. It doesn't put a time limit. On, on the emergency, and it doesn't require that the governor come back and ask, um, ask the legislature for an extension. It allows the, um, the ex- executive orders that are ongoing right now and doesn't require legislative oversight of those executive orders. And then you fast forward to 1976. You have a 28-day time limit with respect to it. Uh, it still doesn't require legislative oversight of the executive orders, but that time limit does kind of put 
a legislative oversight in place. However, the 1976 law refers back to the law from 1945, and it says it's not intended to be read in such a way as to limit the 1945 law at all. So it's necessary. There is definitively a conflict in the law. Either there is a 28-day limitation or there's not a 28-day limitation. And so this bill is intended to clarify. We are, we're going to have a limitation in the law, and, and we're going to recognize that the, state's, the state is actually a Republican government, not, not, you know, not Republican versus Democrat, but there's you know, three branches of government. And it's, it's actually going to rec- recognize that there's legislative oversight. We're going to recognize that there's a need for emergency powers sometimes and then recognize that there's a need for legislative oversight after that emergency dies down. Now, she's said or indicated that she would veto uh, you know, these if they came in front of her. And, and would there be enough votes to override a veto? I don't, honestly, I don't know. I can't speak on behalf of the Democrats. I would hope that they would recognize that it is a necessary component of any government that there be that there would be a check and balance of any powers whatsoever. I, I would hope that everybody would recognize that. That's something that is a foundational principle of our government. We were never intended to run as a dictatorship. That was something that we fought against from the very foundations of our beginning. So when people say, look, the only reason that this is happening is because you've got the GOP in charge of the Senate and, and the House, and you have a, a Democrat in, in the governor's mansion, that this is a political maneuver, your answer is no. I, I would hope not. I mean, we've, we, this law has been in place for 70 years, and, the, and we've never had this issue before. As a matter of fact, very similar language, it exists all across the country, and we're not having this issue all across the country. We have this issue uniquely here. So when it comes to reopening the economy, obviously the governor last week uh, opening up some sectors and now looking at others like construction and, and uh, things like that. How, from your perspective, legislatively speaking, I mean, how will a reopening of the economy look? How should it look, in your view? I want us to look very carefully and make sure that what we're doing is opening as quickly as possible, as safely as possible. We are in an economic crisis right now, and when I, when I, I can't use that word strongly enough. Our uh, supply chain is absolutely broken. Our educational system is is. The cuts that we're looking at is, is scaring me as the chair of the Education Committee. I'm, I'm very, very concerned about what this looks like moving forward for our children. We need to make sure that these are areas that we're protecting. And, and then I'm also concerned that we have oversight. This Again, our country was never intended to run. Our state was never intended to run with a singular executive. It was intended to run with, with significant oversight. So um, everything I'm doing moving forward is to make sure that we have legislative oversight that we have that we have the three branches of government working uh, in in concert to make sure that we are listening to all of the voices and making sure that we're getting everybody back to work as quickly as possible as safely as possible well as as john asked with the the reopening do you think it'll be via sectors like uh, say north of us where there's less covid 19 as it works its way toward the metro detroit area where there are more uh, cases do you think some of those businesses even if it's a similar type of business as to those that are in the more infected areas uh would start to open up because of the less uh, epidemic uh, pandemic there that makes region? sense that again we're going to be working in the land of the possible right so again i'm not the dictator i we're going to have to be working with in concert with what everybody is agreeing to the governor put out a framework for what she thought ought to happen. I'm very, very concerned that Livingston County is grouped into all of southeast Michigan. Uh, the numbers for uh, Oakland County are, are 7,000 cases, Wayne County 16,000, Macomb County 5.3 thousand, uh, even Washtenaw is 1,000, Genesee's 1,500, and then Livingston has 330. And we're grouped into that entire group as, as the region for opening. I, I don't think that's, that's a good way to go. If we're going to be going with the governor's plan for reopening, I'd like to I'd, I'd like to, us to go by counties, and I'm, I, that's something that I'm going to push very very hard for. If if we're going to be looking at at doing it that way, if we're going to be looking at doing it based on on the level of um, of of issue with uh, with COVID, then we need to make sure that we're looking at it as as granular as possible. You know, as you mentioned, you're chair of the education committee. 
what is the feedback that you're getting in terms of what the districts have done with the you know the online learning models that they've put out for their kids? Uh, you know, I know from my perspective as a parent, uh, you know, obviously none of this can be mandated, um, and so it's just being put out there. And, and but the kids pick up on that pretty quick that they're not really mandated to do this. And I know that there's been some. Um, uh, uh, you know, I guess some frustration on the part of educators that, you know, they're getting varying levels of participation and that some districts are doing better than others in terms of getting these kids ready. And then I guess when we're looking long term, hopefully when we're coming back to regular school in September, we're going to have, it seems, a bit of an educational crisis. Yeah. We're going to have a lot of a students lot of coming up. back who are not going to be properly prepared. Is that your sense of things? John, that is one of the best questions I have been asked in a very, very long time, and I think it's, um, it's something we ought to get together and talk about a lot more. So NWEA says most of the kids are going to be coming back to school in the fall about a year behind. Um, and the different school districts, I've literally been going district by district to see what they're doing, and many of the districts are actually holding the kids accountable. They're, they are looking at it. They're going, they're going to be making sure that the kids are turning in their, their schoolwork, that they're actually grading on it. Um, many of them are not. Some of them aren't even teaching new information, and they're only uh, ensuring mastery of existing information. And none of that was uh, was the plan. <laughs> the, the ensuring mastery was not the plan. New information was definitely the plan. I pushed really hard to try to hold them accountable in, in that we wanted to know what worked. We know that we're going to need to know how to distance teach in the future because there's going to be a significant number of children who are either immunocompromised or come from immunocompromised families that will not be able to come back in the fall. We're going to need to be able to distance teach those children. So we need to know what kind of distance teaching actually works, and if we don't test in, in the early summer, we don't know what that looks like. And, and this is, uh, this, like I said, this is going to be a, a, a much longer conversation than the few minutes that we have, but I would yeah. love to have that discussion. No, no, you're right. That's a much longer topic. But it, So just before we let you go, because we're almost out of time, but on this issue, so the, the, the point is, though, that students, though, right now, the districts, like you said, some are mandating, some are not, but at the end of the day, they really can't legally mandate, right? I mean, all students are going to be passed through no matter what. They are going to be passed through, but many of many of the... The school districts are saying we're we're taking your your coursework and we're going to be grading you on it, so they they can pass them through and and still have a GPA that that recognizes their effort in the process. And so it sounds to me though, and I would agree with this, so the districts that do that are going to be better prepared when it, when September hits. Significantly, yeah. and and across the country, I a lot of them are. Some of them aren't, but a lot of them are. And and I um, I'd be happy to show you some of the the communication that that I've I've picked up on across the state. Some of it is fantastic, and and many of the schools have been going above and beyond, and they are absolutely extraordinary. And then some um, some of the districts have not worked quite as hard. And then just one more th one more thing before we do let you go. Going back to the regionalization of the opening. So if areas that have less. Uh, infection open up before areas that have more what's to prevent people from those areas moving to the less infected areas would that be part of the of the fix in terms of saying look you can't go get your hair cut in Gladwin <laughs> because they opened up first you really I that's not going to be something that's possible that's that it, it, it is recognized that people will be moving around there was never a time when we advocated for flattening the curve, that we expected we would get to zero. When you flatten the curve, you lengthen the baseline. So there was always going to be a level of risk once COVID was introduced. There's always going to be that level of risk, and there's going to be a new normal that we have to learn to deal with and have to learn to work with. And so we have to learn to live safely with this instead of trying to um, trying to live without any uh, additional risk whatsoever. And it's it's just it's it's a new normal, and it's unfortunate. Uh, but we can do it. We can do this. State Senator Lana Tice, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it.